All right, welcome back. Today I'm gonna to be celebrating finally getting this channel up to 1,000 subscribers. Thanks to everyone who's supported the channel. I really appreciate it. And I've really enjoyed talking to you all about books and hopefully that's something that's gonna carry on for the foreseeable future. I thought a good way to celebrate would be to do a repeat of a video that I've done previously, 50 books in my room, only this time I've picked 50 more books in my room. But that's enough nettering because there are a lot of books to get through, so let's get going. So first up we have Middlemarch by George Eliot. So I read this recently, actually on audiobook, not in the physical copy, um, but I really enjoyed the book. It's meant to be one of the best English novels of all time, and I've certainly seen it top a lot of lists. And I have to say, I didn't think that was the case. I, I've read things that I've enjoyed more uh, in classic literature, but it was still a good book. I think what kept it back for me maybe was something about the plot and the characters. It's one of those novels that's really about the characters. And while the characterization was good, maybe for me it was just a little bit too realist. And so they weren't as colorful or flamboyant as I tend to like my characters. But still, very good book and definitely recommend. Next up, we have a book that's been with me for a long time, and that is The Great Gatsby. This is one of the uh, Wordsworth Classics editions, which if you've ever seen them, uh, this is quite a good cover because the Wordsworth Classics uh, covers are absolutely terrible. And this I actually read for the first time in school, so it's got all of my notes inside. I, I do like The Great Gatsby. It's not one of my favorite books in the world, but it is a good story. It's concise, it's to the point, and it's got some great characters. Next up, we have a book that I'm not gonna throw because it's uh, brand new and I haven't read it yet, so I, I wanna keep it in, in a nice intact state. And it's the first book in Marcel Proust's In Search of Lost Time. Uh, I've not started this yet. All I know about this is that it's a classic and that it's incredibly long. And I don't even think it's finished. I think he died before he finished it. So <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping that each volume at least tells a complete story so it doesn't feel like a, a waste of time in the end. Now for the next book, which is Finnegan's Wake by James Joyce. I read Ulysses and I've talked about that on the channel. Uh, I've since read uh, a portrait of the artist as young man, but I'm yet to tackle this behemoth. Uh, and I think I'm probably gonna wait a while before I tackle it because Ulysses was quite a lot. I just finished Juliet, which was a massive book, not as weird, or at least weird in a different way, uh, to Finnegan's Wake. But I, I wanna leave it a while before I tackle any kind of big hefty books like this. But I am looking forward to reading this if I'm, <laughs> but I'm also maybe a bit nervous about it as well because it's notoriously difficult and I'm not expecting to understand any of it really. And last is a book that I have talked about on the channel and that is Bleak House by Dickens. This is a really nice leather bound book that I got from a friend. When he left town, he left this behind and said I could have it. So um, yeah, it's a really nice volume. It's actually one of two because Bleak House is a massive uh, tome. And I think when I get round to reading Bleak House again, uh, I will definitely read it on the page this time. Although the audiobook with Mary Margulies is fantastic. So definitely give that a go if you haven't read or listened to it. Okay, so that's it for the first round of classics. Let's move on to some fantasy. So the first one I've got here with me is a book that I actually don't know anything about. It's called Otherland by Tad Williams. And maybe if any of you have read this or heard of this, you can tell me about it in the comments. So I can't recommend this, but it is something on my bookshelf. Next up, oh, next up we have The Magician's Nephew. Now I used to have all of these uh, types or these editions of the books. Uh, my grandma gave them to me when I was really small and I kept most of them, but sadly I have lost quite a few now. But these were the ones that I always read growing up and that's why they're kind of a bit tatty. This is one of the less tattier ones, which is why I'm showing it. Narnia is one of my favorite fantasy series. I feel like these days it's not as popular as it once was, which I think is a, a real shame because I think the Chronicles of Narnia are fantastic and definitely worth your time. Next up is another book that I haven't read, but I do know a bit more about this one because uh, it's quite famous and it's Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. Again, it's one of these lovely leather bound editions. Not from my friend this time. This is another one that I've pinched uh, from my uh, grandparents library at home. Again, it's got some nice images. I'm looking forward to getting into this eventually, but I just have so many books that I haven't read, which I think is a good thing. I think it's nice to have a bookshelf where there are lots of books that you haven't read yet because then you know, you've got a lot of choice. Um, so this is something that I hope I will get to at some point, but haven't to yet. And I won't throw this one because it's fancy. Uh, next up, another classic that I have read, uh, and that's Dickens' A Christmas Carol. I got this uh, last Christmas, actually, um, and it's, it's quite a nice edition, although I have to say it looks better, I think, 
uh, on an image than in reality because it looks like it's leather bound but it's actually not um, but it is very nice and it's a very short Dickens book um, it's the famous story a Christmas Carol so I don't need to say much about it um, but it's wonderful and it even has the uh, original artwork from when it was published I believe so if you haven't read much Dickens and you want a little taste then a Christmas Carol not a bad place to start Next up we have what is probably the oldest book that I have on my shelf. Possibly, there might be another one, but I think this is certainly one of them. And that is um, The Bromeliad by Terry Pratchett. Um, and this is probably the book that has the accolade of being the longest, having the longest time on my to be read pile. Because I have actually never read this book and I got it when I was about eight years old. So I'm surprised I've kept it. <laughs> um, and I don't know why I haven't read it. Um, I have read some of Pratchett's Discworld series, and I don't mind it. I don't love it as much as some people seem to do. And like with the Tad Williams book that I showed you earlier, if any of you have read it, let me know in the comments what you think of it. And uh, if you think I should uh, should give it a go and review it on the channel, uh, then let me know, and I and, and I will, because it's been there for a very long time, and I feel like at this point it's just been there too long for me not to read it at some point. And last is another hefty tome book. So this is similar to the Necronomicon, which I showed in my last video, the HP Lovecraft Tales, uh, but this time it's Conan the Barbarian. Um, and also this is something that has been set there for a long time and I've never read all of it. I've read bits of it, uh, bits here and there, because it is very big and it's not bad. I've kept hold of it, uh, but I think maybe the reason why I've kept hold of it is more to do with the lovely leather bound gold uh, leaf uh, cover <laughs> than the actual content, because. I don't love uh, Conan the Barbarian at uh, the tales, so yeah, it, it's all right, but not my favorite, but it does look nice on the shelf and that's why it's still there. <laughs> okay, now to some more classics again, because there are quite a lot of classics on the list because those are the things that are mostly on my shelf and the things that I haven't already talked about in my other videos. So first up, we have a book that I did talk about before, but not on this kind of video, and that is Valette by Charlotte Bronte. For me, this is definitely the most underrated of not just Charlotte Bronte's novels, but all of the Bronte novels. It's just wonderful. It's incredibly hard to read because it's uh, an incredible, the, the protagonist is very shy. She's a very internal person, and most of the story is deeply psychological. It's all about her and her psychology and the way she experiences the world but it's such a good book um, and I really enjoyed reading it. It was really hard to read, but, but I did enjoy it. And I think it's definitely uh, Charlotte Bronte's best work and one of the best uh, Bronte novels for sure. While we're on the topic of Brontes, I do have two more uh, Bronte novels on the list. So I'll quickly go through those. Uh, one is Jane Eyre. Again, one of these nice uh, leather bound ones like Alice in Wonderland. Uh, I did like Jane Eyre, but of the famous Bronte novels, this was the one that I enjoyed the least. I just found that Mr. Rochester is a very, kind of inconsistent character and also Jane she, you know she starts off as this like spunky girl but then she sort of ends up in a relationship with this man and I don't know it just I enjoy the early part of the story where she's a kid growing up but I think when we get to Mr. Rochester and basically from there the story just kind of becomes very erratic uh, I think ah! <laughs> I think that um, Charlotte Bronte did a lot better uh, as she progressed in her career I think that Shirley is better than this, and I think that Villette is just light years ahead, <laughs> better than this. So, a little controversial opinion for you there, but let me know what you think of Jane Eyre in the comments. And the other uh, Bronte book, which I have on my Kindle, so I'll just put up an image on the screen somewhere while I'm editing, uh, and that is Agnes Grey. Uh, now, this is one of Anne Bronte's books, her first book, and I have to say that if this was the only book that she published, then I could sort of agree with her being the lesser Bronte sister. Maybe that's quite controversial to say now because she's seen as kind of under, you know, underrated. Um, but, but I think Agnes Grey is just not a very good book. It has all the things that I moan about about novels. It's incredibly moralistic. The protagonist is basically just, so she's a governess and she goes to a house with these spoiled kids. And it's basically her just whinging about how bad her job is and how terrible these kids are. And then at the end of the story, she marries the person that she likes and the kids all, you know, bad things happen to them because they're bad people. And it's just very, it's basically just Anne Bronte whinging about how bad her job was, which is fine, but I don't think it necessarily makes the best kind of story. And I think she massively improved when she wrote The Ten Old of Wildfell Hall. But yeah, Agnes Grey uh, wouldn't recommend uh, for sure. 
So moving away from the Brontes now, and to Balzac uh, with Pierre Goriot, or Goriot perhaps, I don't know. I am not very good at French or any pronunciation, including English. So, <laughs> uh, Pierre Goriot by Balzac. So I read this for a book club. It was one of my partner's choices for book club. Uh, and it's a good story. It's quite tragic. It's basically about a father who, I think he was working class, but he builds himself up in his career, becomes quite wealthy, and he has these daughters who he, you know, he looks out for them and tries to do the best for them, but they kind of use him for his money. And the story is him just giving all of his money away to them as he becomes old and dies. It sort of reminds me of King Lear in that sense. You have this kind of aging uh, patriarch who has these terrible <laughs> daughters that sort of ruin his life. Uh, and it's a good book. I, I, enjoy, I enjoyed reading it. Um, it's, it's quite a sad story, but it's a very good story. And last but not least for this pile, we have a book that I have talked about in a couple of reading vlogs before, and that is Moby Dick. Um, but I just wanted to talk about it again because I really like uh, this book uh, and I really like this edition of this uh, book. So again, don't need to say much about the content of the story. I'm sure you all know what Moby Dick is about, but it's definitely a book that I would recommend because it's one of those novels that I thought uh, and always thought that it would be stuffy and boring and I would hate it. And when I found out before reading it that it has these huge passages about whaling, I thought I'd hate it even more. <laughs> but then when I listened to it in audiobook, I was just blown away by how good the story is. It's fantastic. Um, so yeah, don't be uh, put off by, by this one. It's big, it's hefty, but it's a really good book uh, and, I, and, I, and I would recommend. Okay, now for some non-fiction. So first up we have a book that I got when I was a teenager. It's sort of a joke book, but I thought that would be quite fun to, to share. And that is it's called Urban Legends. And it's basically a book of, well, urban legends. And some of them are quite funny. On the front here, you can see one of the legends. It's basically this uh, myth that there was a cow on a plane and the cow somehow fell off of the plane and went into a ship. <laughs> and the ship obviously uh, sunk because a cow went through it. <laughs> Quite a fun book, if it indeed is even for sale anymore. Next we have a biography, uh, again on Nico, uh, who is a, a singer from the 60s. And I mentioned another book by her in the previous uh, video, which is a biography that covers her whole life. This one uh, was written by one of her bandmates towards the end of her life, when she was washed up incredibly uh, addicted to heroin and probably everything else and she's kind of crazy uh, and it's a very dark uh, book about that time period and one thing that I like about it is that most uh, biographies of artists tend to just focus on you know the great works that they did and the time of their life around then and you always kind of just ignore them when they get old you know we might reel them out to give them some awards every now and then uh, <laughs> but otherwise we don't really care um, so I, I like this book because it doesn't do that. It kind of focuses on uh, the end of someone's career, uh, which, you know, is not something you see every day when it comes to musical artists. So an interesting book, and if you're interested in Nico, definitely worth a read. Now, another biography, uh, also related to someone that I talked about in my last 50 books in my room video, uh, and that is uh, H.P. Lovecraft. Um, so this is a biography, and I think as well uh, a study of some of his famous works, and I really enjoyed it, and it's kind of got me motivated again to kind of get back into Lovecraft. Uh, another non-fiction book. Uh, this one is probably only interesting if you're wanting to become a writer or an artist, uh, and it's a huge uh, book that essentially has tips uh, and tricks for if you want to get your work published or publish your work yourself. It's got great advice in. It also has a directory in the back of like agents and things that you can get in contact with to show them your work. So it's a great book and if you're, you know, if you're a budding writer who wants to get work published, I would definitely recommend this because it really did help me. So hopefully it'll help you too. And last but not least uh, is another book from Camille Parlier. Uh, this one is though not about literature, but it's about art and it's called Glittering Images. Uh, now I, uh, I'm not a connoisseur of art by any stretch. Uh, if you asked me, you know, if you showed me some famous picture and said who painted that, probably not going to have the answer for you. Um, but this book uh, really did get me into uh, art for the first time. Um, Palia writes in a very nice uh, style. It's very accessible. She doesn't kind of, you know, shove a load of jargon at you. Instead, she just kind of, you know, it's like she's taking you through a museum where these pictures are, are on display and she's giving you a very personal kind of story about what she 
uh, what she thinks of them. So it's really good and it covers a lot of time, time and a lot of ground. You've got Impressionism, you've got Picasso, you've even got ancient Greek art and ancient Egyptian art. Uh, and in the last chapter, she has a very strange uh, rant about how uh, the special effects in the third film of the uh, second trilogy of the Star Wars series is like some of the best cinema of all time, which I don't know if I agree with it, but it's certainly interesting. And as always with Parlia, she's just really passionate and energetic about what she does, which is why I enjoy reading her, even if she is, you know, quite controversial. That's it for nonfiction for a while. Let's jump into some gothic horror. Okay, so first we have a Clive Barker book that I've never talked about on the channel, and that is The Damnation Game. I think this is his first novel, his full-length novel that he ever wrote, and I think it's his only exclusively horror novel that he actually wrote, because after this he then went into the more fantasy horror side of things with things like Weave World, which I've talked about before. The Damnation Game is a good book, but I certainly wouldn't think it would, but I certainly wouldn't say it's the best of Barker's work. I think for his horror, the books of blood are a lot better than this because there's just so much in those short stories. And I think as a novelist, he's just kind of flexing his muscles, if you like, in this book. But it's still very good and I enjoyed reading it. Uh, but it's, you know, it's not something that I would return to very often. Bloop. Next up, we have another book that's just kind of languished. It's on the shelves for, for a long time. Uh, and that is Susan Hill's uh, the Small Hand. Uh, so I didn't know that Susan Hill is the author of A Woman in Black as well. Uh, and I actually r listened to The Woman in Black maybe a year ago or something, maybe even more than a year ago now. Uh, and then I realized that it was the same author. Uh, and I really enjoyed The Woman in Black. I thought it was a really good ghost story, but somehow it hasn't motivated me to read this one. <laughs> but I think I've kept this one because I think that cover is just um, gorgeous. I love the kind of Obviously you can't feel feel it, but this blue stuff here is like ribbed. It's a very beautiful book and hopefully I will, I'll give it a go because I did enjoy the, the Woman in Black, so I should enjoy this. Uh, next up is an Anne Radcliffe novel that I haven't read yet and haven't spoken about, uh, and that is A Sicilian Romance. Uh, it's just on my to read pile, so I'll get to it soon. Uh, I don't know much about it, but one thing that I am relieved about is that it is a short Anne Radcliffe book, uh, because if you've watched my reviews of the Mysteries of Rodolfo, and even the Italian to some extent, one of my complaints about Radcliffe is she just waffles on and on and on about these descriptions, and the descriptions are very nice, but sometimes it damages the pacing of the story. So I'm hoping that with, with this one, uh, things will be a little bit more concise, and so I won't get as, you know, my eyes won't glaze over as much when I'm reading it. So looking forward to reading that one. Uh, next is a book that's just kind of hilarious. Uh, so I don't know if any of you have heard of this, but it's a book called Dracula, uh, the Undead, uh, and if ever there was a sequel that didn't need to be written, and if ever there was a sequel that literally destroyed its source material, uh, in, the, in, in a good way though, it's this book. I don't want to spoil what happens in, in this story, but basically it follows Mina uh, and Jonathan and their now son, who, who they had and has now grown up, uh, many years later after the events of Dracula, uh, and Dracula returns. Uh, and there's also a new vampire, a female vampire, uh, who is basically just a lesbian fantasy of the uh, authors, I think. And, it, and it's a story about that, but I won't say any more about it. And now, I did enjoy it when I first read it, because I was a teenager and I just loved how gory and disgusting it was. Uh, but I reread it, you know, being a bit older, uh, and yeah, it is quite trashy, and it really does ruin uh, the original book if you kind of take it as canon. So, I, I, but I still, I still sort of would recommend it, just because I think it's... You know, uh, if you see it as like a alternate reality B-movie thing, then I think it's kind of fun and it's kind of silly. Um, so yeah, an, an interesting book. Uh, and last but not least is a book that I got recently along with the M. Radcliffe book, and that is The Tales of Mystery and Imagination by Edgar Allan Poe. Now I've never actually read any Edgar Allan Poe, but I have seen some of the Vincent Price adaptions of some of his stories, and I really enjoyed those adaptions. So I'm hoping that I'll enjoy the written work just as much. Okay, let's do some poetry. So I don't read poetry that often, uh, but I have started to read it a little bit more uh, recently, and, and I've actually been enjoying it a lot more than I did when I was younger, because when I was younger, didn't get it, didn't understand it, but now I'm appreciating it a little bit more. And the first set of poetry that I want to talk about is Lord Byron's poetry. 
So this is actually a book that did feature in my last 50 books in my room, but back then I hadn't read it. Um, whereas now I'm, I don't know if you can see that very well, but that little marker there is how far through I am. Now I talked about Child Harold's Pilgrimage on this channel, which is one of his longer narrative poems, and I wasn't much of a fan of that, and so I put this collection away for a bit. Uh, but recently I've moved on to some of his shorter works, and I really have been enjoying uh, these short poems. There's one called Darkness, which is just two pages of this apocalyptic scene, and it's just so atmospheric and brooding, and it's, you know, the world's collapsed. I think basically the, the premise is that the sun's gone out, uh, and it's just a wonderful work. Uh, then there's also some great love poems. Uh, she Walks in Beauty is one of the famous ones, but there's another one. I can't remember the title of it, but basically there's a couple, uh, and he goes away for a long time, probably to war, comes back and she's now seeing someone else and he's obviously quite upset. Uh, and there's just some wonderful lines uh, in, in all of these poems. Uh, so yeah, I, I would definitely now uh, recommend Byron. Next up we have The Odyssey, which, you know, I think everyone knows what The Odyssey is by Homer. It's a wonderful story. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I also read The Iliad more recently and I didn't enjoy that as much. It was certainly a harder read because it's less about a narrative and a journey and more about just, you know, the battles, which you know, basically means you have lots of different characters and most of them are just getting killed. Whereas the Odyssey is more cohesive, it's more of a narrative, and so it kind of fits, I think, more into what our perception of a story should be. I really enjoyed it, uh, and I wasn't expecting to. <laughs> I thought it might be a bit too stuffy and old, but actually it wasn't, it was really good. Also, I have the poetry of Emily Dickinson, her collected works. I was inspired to read Emily Dickinson because of reading Parlia's Sexual Personae, which ends with a, uh, discussion of Emily Dickinson, and so I was motivated by Parlia to actually read some Dickinson. Haven't started yet, uh, but, I, but I will start, and it's there on the Kindle, and I got it quite recently, so I probably will get to it reasonably soon. And last but not least is this book of the Canterbury Tales, also pilfered from my grandparents' uh, library. I do take them back after I've read them, by the way. I'm not just like slowly stealing everything from, <laughs> from their library. But yeah, this is a wonderful uh, reproduction of the Canterbury Tales. It has some, oh, some lovely pictures in and images of the original text. Uh, something that I haven't read yet, um, because I got this around the time that I was reading The Fairy Queen, and The Fairy Queen was oldie English enough uh, so, so I didn't want to read this at the same time. Uh, but now that I'm done with The Fairy Queen, I may well get onto this uh, very soon, and I'm certainly looking forward to it. Let's do some philosophy. So for those of you who don't know, I, I do philosophy. That's what I or did philosophy. I've now finished my uh, PhD, um, but I do read a lot of philosophy because of that. So here are some of the books that I have either read or have yet to read in philosophy. First up is this very old uh, book, probably the oldest book that I own, that a friend of mine gave me before she left uh, left town, um, and it's a book on aesthetics by Longinus, I don't know, that's quite how you say his name, and it's the first time that the concept of the sublime, which if, if you know your gothic literature, they always talk about the sublime, uh, it's, it's the first time that that concept uh, got philosophical analysis. Uh, I have read a little bit of it, uh, but not enough to really say much about the analysis yet, but I'm certainly looking forward to reading this because I've been getting really into aesthetics lately. Uh, next up is uh, one of these very short introduction books, which if you don't haven't heard of these uh, books, they're really good if you just want a kind of teaser into a topic. Uh, and this one is on continental philosophy. It's, it's a good book. Uh, continental philosophy is renowned for being really hard to get into because it's not very clear in its style. Um, so this is a good kind of introduction uh, to that kind of way of doing philosophy. Uh, next up is the only Nietzsche that I've read so far, and this is his The Gay Science. It's a really good book. Uh, I, I wasn't expecting to understand Nietzsche because he, he was the first uh, continental philosopher that I read, but actually he's reasonably accessible, at least in this book I, I found him uh, to be. Uh, it's certainly a different style from the kind of analytic way that, that I do philosophy and that most universities in the UK do philosophy. Um, but it's a really good book, uh, and I think the reason why I picked this one to read first was because a friend of mine said uh, it's a good introduction to his main ideas. So if you're interested in Nietzsche, uh, go for this one. And while we're on the topic of continental philosophy, another book that I am currently reading uh, and I'm not understanding very much of at all is Being in Time by a philosopher called Heidegger. Uh, and this is 
Like if you want, uh, like if you want to see how abstruse and difficult continental philosophy can be, then have a read of this book because it is just so hard to understand. It's so abstract. It's so weird. Uh, and yeah, I, I think I'm about halfway through, and I've probably understood about five percent, probably even less than five percent. Um, but I'm hoping that when it kind of like I can feel that things are starting to come together. So I'm hoping that. Even if I don't understand every little minutiae of detail, I'll kind of have a general sense of, of what the hell he's talking about. Fingers crossed. Another philosophy book in which kind of is a mix of the continental and analytical philosophy style is The Second Sex by Simone de Beauvoir, which is a kind of landmark feminist text, and it's a wonderful text. I would definitely recommend reading it. Uh, whether you're into feminism or not doesn't really matter. I think it's just a wonderful book. She analyzes kind of what it is to be a woman uh, throughout history and time and in literature. It's very sprawling, it's huge, uh, but it's enjoyable. You know, she, she writes in a way that's engaging and accessible, uh, unlike some continental philosophers which tend to write in this sort of abstract way, which makes it really hard to know what they're saying. Again, I don't agree with everything that she says, but I certainly enjoy uh, reading her work and I definitely enjoyed completing that book. Uh, now onto something that's sort of a mix of philosophy and psychology, and that is Civilization and Its Discontents by Freud. Now Freud is very unpopular these days, but I think that this book is actually uh, a fantastic uh, book. Basically it's a book about repression and how having a very moralistic society can cause people to become incredibly neurotic, and Freud is obviously he's talking about kind of sexual repression, and there's also a short paper in this as well where he basically advocates for uh, a liberation of kind of sexual morality, which is quite modern. And he also applies this to women. So I think it's, it's a good example of Freud being a little bit more complex than I think he's often uh, represented. I enjoyed this work. It's very slim and accessible though, so I would definitely recommend it. Next up, we have an older work of philosophy. This is uh, Principles on Human Knowledge and Three Dialogues by Berkeley. So Berkeley is what is known as in philosophy, uh, an idealist which roughly means that he thinks that reality, so the, the world that we see, is dependent on our minds, um, which is a very strange philosophical view because, you know, we like to think that there's the mind here and then there's reality there and they're kind of separate and the mind is kind of perceiving reality. Uh, but for idealists, that's not right. It's a very interesting book. Uh, I enjoyed reading it. It was quite accessible for something that was so old and I always like a crazy theory, so uh, I enjoyed it for that reason too. Uh, next up is a book called What the Buddha Taught, um, and this is a book that I got when I was a teenager for a project that I did on Buddhism in school. Um, it's a really good book. Uh, I enjoyed it back then. I haven't read it since then, um, but if you just want kind of a introduction to some of the core ideas of Buddhism, then it's a good book and you should, you should read it. <laughs> So next up we have David Hume's A Treatise on Human Nature. So Hume is probably one of my favourite uh, of the old philosophers. Uh, I find that I agree with him on a lot of things, especially with his views on morality uh, and his views on aesthetics um, and his views on religion too. Uh, I, I mean, I don't think I agree with everything that he says, but he is someone who I do find a lot of agreement with uh, and I just think his work is great. If you're interested in Hume, I, I, you know, it's hard going because it's old, but, it, but it's a good book and I would definitely recommend it if you're interested in the history of philosophy. Okay, so, oh, I've realised that actually there's some fantasy that I've missed. This here is the Lord of the Rings trilogy, which is in this lovely bound um, version here. This is a wonderful edition. It's got all the original artwork that uh, Tolkien did himself. Unfortunately, I aren't the biggest fan of the Lord of the Rings. Yeah, I, I don't know what it is about Lord of the Rings, but it doesn't grab me in the way that I expected it to. Um, but yeah, let me know what you think of Lord of the Rings in the comments, and if you think I should go back and give it another chance, because, you know, maybe maybe I would be able to uh, enjoy it a lot more if I read it now. We're on the home stretch. So here is a big bulk collection of all of the Jane Austen novels. I've read Northanger Abbey, which I've talked about, uh, and I'm yet to read all of the other ones, so I don't have much to say about them. Here we have another big box set. Uh, this time it's uh, Shakespeare's Plays. Uh, so I'm doing uh, my Shakespeare reading challenge this year, which means going through all of the tragedies uh, and comedies and histories. Well, not all of them, just 12 of them. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, so this is the uh, collection that I'm reading from, and very good collection that it is. To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee. Again, story that I probably don't need to introduce very much. This is a copy that I read in school, uh, in year nine, I think it was. And yeah, uh, I enjoyed it. Uh, I never read the sequel uh, and I uh, don't really want to. 
Uh, the Name of the Rose. It's a tough book, uh, and I think it's probably a book that I'm most conflicted about because you know it's, it's one of those books that's quite academic and, and it's quite dry, but you can tell that the person is like really, they know their stuff, um, and and so it's sort of hard to appreciate. But but I think it overall in a good way. Um, yeah. Uh, next up we have uh, Death in Venice. Uh, which is a short story by Thomas Mann, but this also contains some of his other short stories. I actually haven't got to uh, Death in Venice yet. I've just read the stories before that. I think I'm almost to Death in Venice, um, but I'm really enjoying it. He, he, he's a very good short story um, writer. Uh, a lot of his stories are about broken relationships and unrequited love, um, but he manages to do it in a way that isn't overly sentimental or schmaltzy, which is a tricky thing to do if you're writing those kinds of stories, so. Good stuff. Next up we have Naked Lunch by William Burroughs. William Burroughs, uh, he's a beat writer, beat generation writer. Uh, and this book, uh, he basically wrote, or is a collection of things that he wrote while he was out of his mind, uh, addicted to heroin. And it's meant to be an anti-drugs book uh, by kind of showing you just how destructive that is. But it's also quite entertaining. Uh, and very strange and very surreal. Burroughs himself said that you could pick this up at any chapter and start from there because there's no actual order. Uh, so, <laughs> a weird one, but a good one. Next up we have The Players of Oscar Wilde. Uh, I think that I prefer Oscar Wilde's fiction and his short stories to his plays, I have to say. Uh, I think his humour is a little bit stilted. Uh, and I think that's just because humour is the sort of thing that doesn't age as well as, I don't know, horror or anything else. But yeah, I, I, I would recommend reading his plays. I especially enjoyed Salome, because that was quite different. Uh, and I enjoyed An Ideal Husband. I think that of his plays, the focus on the social stuff, An Ideal Husband was my favourite. Because it kind of had the humour, but also had more substance than his other plays. So yeah, I would recommend Oscar Wilde's plays, but if you're wanting to get into his work, Go with Dorian Gray or go with his fairy tales because his fairy tales are just, they're the best. <laughs> and last but not least, some odds and loose ends. Um, so uh, back to philosophy for the first one, we have the philosophies of India. So this is something that I bought like last week uh, and it's because I am really wanting to get into Eastern philosophy as well as continental philosophy because I just want to kind of, you know, make my breadth a bit wider. Uh, academia is quite a hard job market to get into. So I'm hoping that if I learn more broadly, then I'll have more to kind of offer uh, when I'm applying for jobs. So we'll see how that goes. But yeah, I haven't started this yet uh, because I'm still reading another big book on philosophy, uh, which I have already talked about. Um, so, but this is probably what I'll be reading next. Uh, next up, we have a weird uh, <laughs> choice for this video, but I really was running out of things to pick. Uh, and this is a journal, a philosophy journal. And the reason why I picked this is because it is the uh, journal in which uh, one of my papers was published in. Uh, in fact, it was my first publication and to this day still is my only publication because I'm just starting out. Um, but yeah, I, I was happy to have my uh, paper accepted. It was a, a great moment of validation. Um, so yeah, uh, there, there's my uh, journal article. Next up, we have uh, a book that everyone will know, uh, and that is the Holy Bible. Um, so I'm not actually uh, a Christian uh, or religious at all, but I am interested in religion. Uh, and I have set myself this challenge of reading uh, the religious texts because, I don't know, uh, but, but that's what I've set myself, so I'm doing it. Um, and this is the book that I decided to start with. It's been tough going, uh, I'm not gonna lie. Probably the hardest thing that I've ever read, especially the early books where you just have repetitions of names, like, you know, the son of X and the son of Y and the son of blah, 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 blah. Um, so, <laughs> you know, it's hard going. Uh, but it is quite interesting to actually read the Bible because, you know, people always talk about it and they're always saying things, um, positive and negative. And it's interesting to finally read it and to see what all the uh, hoo-ha is about. And to be honest, I think most of the hoo-ha is the people who talk about the book rather than the book itself. Uh, but there you are. Last but not least uh, is the largest book that I own and a book that I have talked about before. Um, and that is the Egyptian book of the dead. So it's it copies the Book of the Dead out in full images like this. Then it has translations underneath. Uh, and at the back it has kind of a commentary so that you actually know what all these pictures uh, here signify. And essentially the Book of the Dead uh, is 
a guide for people in the afterlife. And the pictures kind of show the afterlife or the various stages to the afterlife. So it's very interesting to kind of know the history of these images and to know what they actually mean. Um, I certainly enjoyed reading it uh, and just even just looking at the images in it, uh, I really enjoy because I love that Egyptian style uh, and the hieroglyphs and everything. So yeah, a wonderful book uh, and I would definitely, if you're interested in Egyptian culture, uh, definitely give it a go. All right, that is it for the list of 50 books in my room. Once again, thanks to everyone that subscribed to this channel. I've really enjoyed making these videos and as I said, I'm definitely gonna be continuing to make videos for you all going forward in the future. Let me know what you think of my choices in the comments below and for some of the books that I didn't like, you know, let me know if you uh, disagree or for some other books that I haven't read, let me know if you think I should uh, bump them up on my to read list. But that is certainly it for this very long video. So take care everyone. I'll see you all next time. Ta-ra.